Hey everybody, I've had a lot of requests for people to show how the katana is put together, the different parts of it, of the Japanese sword. This is a handmade katana blade. I'm holding it with a piece of paper towel here. You can use paper towel to hold a blade, just be careful. You don't want to touch the blade if it's a nice quality blade because the oil from your hand will rust it. So be very careful not to touch the blade with your greasy, oily hands. If you do, make sure you wipe it and oil it with some choji oil right away. But this is a handmade blade, hand forged. Uh, it's a beautiful blade here. This is a standard katana. Um, up here is the uh, kisaki, which is the tip of the blade, you can see here. And each of these is quite unique. And you have the, the boshi here, as in boshi ken, that's the part here. You have the ridge line. You have the uh, the mune, the back of the sword, which is the spine. Remember in the katana, the back part of the sword is not sharp, only under here on the ha. The ha is the edge, that's the only parts that's sharp. A lot of people think a katana is two-sided, it's not, it's a single blade. So if I was fighting with this weapon, I would use the back, the spine of the blade a lot with my hand to use leverage to cut or to ski thrust. So it was very common to put your hand on the back of the blade. Um, you're not, you're not going to cut yourself on the sharp part either unless you draw it. So I can put my hand, this is razor sharp. I can touch it with my hand, but only when I give it that kinetic energy is it going to cut like a saw. So this is a basic seven or eight hundred dollar handmade sword. Now you think that sounds like a lot of money, it's not. In Japan, you can spend tens of thousands of dollars on a sword if you're going to have one handmade by a smith and it will take months and months, if not years, to get. Just polishing a blade like this can take weeks just to polish it. Um, there are still swordsmiths in Japan, although uh, since after World War II, there haven't been as many. Uh, in 1876, it became forbidden to carry one of these in Japan in the open, unless you were a daimyo, or a military person or a police officer, you are not allowed to carry a sword. And these are still illegal to carry in Ireland and Scotland and the UK. All over England, there have been more than 80 deaths with a katana, so you're not allowed to carry these in England on the street or you'll be arrested. In the US, it's still okay to carry, I think in most states, but I'm not positive. You'd have to check your local laws. But carrying a sword might incite panic, so I wouldn't recommend it unless you're going to the dojo, keep it, keep it safe, keep it covered. Um, in 1945, with World War II, martial arts and sword making were banned after this in Japan. It's a strange thing. You would think such a culturally positive thing, something that was so influential would stay, but people got scared after the war and they stopped using swords. Martial arts weren't practiced the same. Sword smithing went way down and it was probably considered a lost art. Um, so there are still regul regulations on making Nihonto. And Nihonto is what they call this in Japan, Nihon, Japanese to sword. Um, now to become a swordsmith, you have to apprentice for like five years to learn how to make these. It's crazy. And I think the regulations are no more than two swords per month can you make if you're a swordsmith. It's highly regulated. You have to register with the government, there are a lot of things you have to do. Um, and you need a license to make a sword in Japan, so it's really a, a unique art form. Now this one was made in China. Uh, don't disparage that because there are some wonderful Chinese blades that come out of China. You don't have to wait as long, they're not as expensive. The swordsmiths there, I'm sure, stole the secrets. They go back and forth. But if you want to buy a Chinese blade, you get what you pay for. If you want to pay $200 or 800 you're going to get what you pay for, but this is a Chinese blade, and I highly recommend this as a sharp and powerful katana. So let's put this back together. I'm not going to go over every detail. Words don't matter. It doesn't matter the names of things. It doesn't matter what you call it, as long as you can use the thing. As a martial art teacher, I don't care if my students know the names of each part of the sword. It's meaningless in a battle. I care if you can use the thing, if you can use your feet and make this an extension of your hand. Now having said that, this is not my soul. A lot of people think this is the soul of the samurai. To me, this is a tool. If it breaks, if it shatters, I don't care. 
as long as I survive. And that's the mindset of the ninja versus the samurai. I treasure these swords, but I treasure them in a limited manner. If they break, they're not heirlooms. I have many swords that have broken over the years. That's okay. If I break a sword in training, I'm not going to blame myself with a training partner. I'll blame the steel or the smith. So be careful how much you treasure these things. It's just an object and nothing is worth your life to save. Some people are so anal about how they take care of their sword and you can't touch it and you can only take it out on this moon and the way you hold it. It's okay to do that stuff, but I'm a pragmatist, not a historian. I want to use this thing. So let's put this back together. Let's see, where's the habaki? The habaki, here it is. This is already on here. This is called a habaki. Habaki is the collar. Could be made of brass or copper or steel. This is what goes back first. So you slide this onto the tang. This is the tang of the sword. This is the part that wouldn't be polished or finished. It's hidden under the suka, under the handle. So this is called the makago. Nakago is the tang. Now the mei, mei would have been here. The mei is a signature. Signature is a smith of the blade. So some really old blades that are made by hand would have a signature here and the tang could be on this side as well. The mei is the signature of the smith. So if you have a really old sword and you want to get it appraised or something, take it to an expert. He or she can take it apart carefully and see if there's a signature and you can trace it back to the maker. This one does not have a signature on it and that's okay by me. This has two of the holes here for the makugi pins. So these are little wooden pins that go in through these holes. There's two of them in this case. These are what hold the handle onto the sword. The handle is called the suka. So this is the handle of a Japanese katana. Anywhere from 11 inches to way up to 15, 16 inches. This is a standard size. And I'll get into more detail about that. But in order to hold this on, you have to have that collar on first. After that, you have this. This is called a sepa. Sepa is just a little ring. It's like a little collar, usually made of copper or iron. This goes on next. It's a little decorative thing here. Then you have the suba guard. So this is a, called suba, T-S-U-B-A. The T is silent, so it sounds like suba. All of these are unique. This one has some gold dragons on it. It's quite beautiful. And there's the hole where the sword goes through. Some of them have an extra large hole in the side here for the kozuka knife. So you could have a knife that you could pull out from your scabbard uh, for cutting meat or for defending yourself or throwing it like a shuriken. Suba guards, they're all quite unique. This is a round one. There are some square ones as well. So here's a suba. Putting this next. Then you have another sepa collar here. Going on next. Now we can take a second and put the hand on, the guard. This is the suka handle. So I'm just going to hammer this on here. There are many ways to put this on. Don't slam it too hard. It's not going to hurt the sword to put this back. So the handle's on there now, and then I can put two of these pegs in. I'm not going to put them in right now. They take some time. You would put two of these pegs, which would hold the handle onto the sword. But don't worry if you don't get them in. Uh, these are really cheap to buy. If you break them, you can make your own. Make sure that your sword has two holes on it if it's a long katana. If it only has one, that means the tang doesn't go all the way down. It could snap in your hand. I have had swords with the tang stopped here and it literally the handle broke. If you want a good quality sword, make sure the tang goes all the way down to the end unless it's a short sword like a wakizashi or a tanto then of course you'll only have one peg. But be very careful with this. So there is the assembled sword. You have the suka, which is the handle. Suka ito is the wrapping. Could be made of cotton or silk. Underneath here is the ray skin, which is usually white. Could be made of stingrays or shark belly. Uh, some are made of plastic. And then you have the manuki, which is the little decorative 
ornate symbol under here, and that can sometimes help you with your handle, your grip. Uh, I don't know if it has any religious purposes or spiritual. These are always handmade, and they're, they have different creatures in here, dragons, butterflies, lots of nature creatures. There's one on each side of the handle. Because she had a butt cap here, this is to hit people with if you needed to. This is also very decorative, and it keeps the suka ito, it keeps the wrapping from coming off the end of the handle here. And then you have the saya, which is the scabbard, S-A-Y-A, saya means sheath or scabbard. Usually these are made of wood and they're handmade to fit the blade. You have the koiguchi, the mouth here. Um, there's usually uh, uh, ito here, the, the wrap on this part, but I don't have it on this particular one. These sayas are often shellacked and painted. This one is decorated with some hand painting here. Um, these are very unique and different. Don't worry if this breaks. Again, in battle, who cares if it breaks? A lot of people in battle would throw this off. So that's the scabbard here. The sagio is the cord. That's what I don't have. Um, the kurikata, this is the little knob here you see. If I hold it this way, this is the kurikata. Uh, this is where the sagio cord would be wrapped in. It's a holder for the, the wrapping. It also keeps your sword from pulling down in your belt. So if I put this in my obi here, the, this butt here keeps it from pulling backwards. So this serves several functions here. And you also know it's always on the outside of the blade. Remember the samurai would carry their blade up. So if I was putting this sword back in the saya, the samurai carries his blade up, not down like a pirate. This isn't Johnny Depp in Pirates of the Caribbean, this is a samurai sword. When you store the sword, you store it with the blade up, and you carry it with the blade, the sharp part, up. Do not carry it this way unless it's a large tachi sword or something. Those were carried on horseback with ropes on them to hang them from your belt. They were suspended so they could move and you could draw it easily. But if you're talking a modern katana, last 300 years, Make sure the sword handle is carried up in your belt. So when I draw, the blade is toward the sky, not down here. You can always tell someone that knows swordsmanship the way they carry their sword. If they carry it blade down or they display it like this with the blade down in their house, they're ignorant to how to use the sword. Now, here's a massive battle sword. This is like a tachi here. This can be anywhere from five to six feet long. Look how long the tsuka is on this one in comparison. It's massive. The suba guard's huge. This would have been drawn out of the scabbard and it would have been used for taking down horses on a battlefield or um, it would have been a large battle sword. So these are very unusual, very heavy, um, kind of a novelty, very hard to wield because once you swing it, it's hard to recover your balance. But this one here is about, uh, I'd say, six feet long. It's massive, very hard to draw. Sometimes you would have a squire help you draw it, or you would just throw the scabbard away. You wouldn't use it. So there's that one. We'll go into that another day. Now, if you have a short tanto, which is a, a knife, the samurai carried the katana. They carried a wakizashi, um, a sidearm here, wakizashi, which is a short sword, also called a shoto. So this one is a short sword, much smaller. This is the one they would keep on when they went indoors. They would take the katana, leave it outside or in the foyer, and then they would take the wakizashi to wear indoors if they needed to protect themselves. This usually always stayed on the samurai, in or outdoors. And sometimes they had a tanto as well, depending on the military class. They would have a third, a knife here, a tanto, and this would be kept on your person at all times as well. This could have been used to defend yourself, to take top knots, perhaps even to cut food or use something utilitarian. So this is a very small handmade tanto. And you can see this groove here. So you have the three swords and there are different types. The suka ito, the coloring was, as far as my research shows, didn't have any real significance. Now I've seen in movies you have different clans with different colors of the handle. That's possible, but I don't know if that's true in history. I think it was a personal preference from my history. And here's some more wrapping the saya here 
just for decoration purposes. This is a gold sword. This is another handmade blade here. Pretty cool. Um, the grain's nice on this one. But I think as far as color goes, most of them had black with white with the same underneath. But you can get many different colors online if you order a sword. You can order whatever color you want. Again, the color doesn't matter on how you use it. So that's the basics of the katana. I have another video out on how to clean swords. Um, and I'll do a video at some point about the different types of weapons. There's so many types of Japanese weapons like the jute, which we're going to use next week in our weapons class. This is a constable's wand and a helmet beater. This is what the police would use to catch sword blades and take away the sword from the bad guys back in the day. So we're going to use this next Tuesday in our weekly weapons class here at the dojo. This is a fun weapon. You've seen a sai. Sai is like a truncheon with two sides off of it from Okinawa. This is the older Japanese jute. Juten, te han. So this is the power of ten men here. And it has this tassel as well. And this was a status symbol. You would wear this if you were a constable or a sheriff of some sort. And you would point and arrest a person. So we're going to use that next week. Last night we used the Kasari Fundo. Or Fundo Kusari here. This is another weapon of the ninja or the samurai would use. In castles when you couldn't draw a sword. They would keep this hiding or hidden. And they would use this. They would deploy it quickly. So that they could arrest a person. Um, and it was quiet so you didn't disturb the daimyo or the king or the queen. So if you couldn't have bloodshed in the castle, if it was sacrilege, you would have one of these. And then you would quietly dispatch the person, tie them up, take them away without the king or the queen even knowing. Kusari fundo, weighted chain. We do that quite a lot here too. So many cool weapons to learn. Flexible, sticks, blades, spears, bow and arrow, guns, you name it. We try to do it all here at the dojo. I hope that was a fun thing for you sword geeks out there. It's by no means perfect. I'm not a um, metallurgist or swordsmith or blacksmith. But you should, know, you should know something about the weapons that you carry. You should know something about the history and how to maintain them so they don't rust and get all destroyed. You guys have a great day. Take care of your weapons. Um, be safe, please. Be very safe. Be careful carrying these in public. Keep them covered in a bag or something if you're going to your dojo to train. Never train with a real sword unless you're doing Tameshi Giri with a sensei. Other than that, use a wooden boken or a shinai bamboo sword or use an iaito, an unsharpened blade. Do not use a shinken in live training because it will cut. And I have heard of people really injuring themselves with a sharp blade. Don't be stupid. All right, until next time, you guys have a great day, and thank you so much for watching.